when we're using a short exact sequence of groups to solve a product problem, in other words, a problem in which I know a subgroup that I want to realize inside of my group, and I know the cosets that I want that subgroup to have, how do I figure out the group itself? We've just seen that the external direct product is one way of solving that product problem. That if B is unknown, and I know A and C, that I can take the direct product of A and C to solve my problem. In this video, I want to convince you that that's not the only way to make a product of A with C. And to do that, I want to show how the groups Zmod3 and Zmod2 can both be put together in a product construction using a short exact sequence, but put together in two non-isomorphic ways. One way that actually gives us a group that's isomorphic to Zmod6, and the other way that gives us a group isomorphic to the symmetric group on three symbols, S3. So how's this going to work? So I want to start out with this very same illustration for both of these cases. I've got a group Zmod3 that I want to realize as a subgroup inside of my product in both cases. I have the group Zmod2 that I want to realize as the cosets of that subgroup in each of these two cases. But in the case on the left, I want this group here in the middle to be isomorphic to Zmod6 and I want the group in the middle here to be isomorphic to the symmetric group S3. Both of those groups have six elements in them, and so this feels like a case for a product construction. Three columns and two rows, therefore we should have six elements. So how are we going to get these two products to not be the same? Well first let's think about that one-to-one -one inclusion of uh, the group A into the group B, right, of Z mod 3 into my product group. Since G needs to be a homomorphism, it needs to send the identity to the identity. So we know that the 0 of Z mod 3 is going to have to get sent to the identity of Z mod 6. And also since the other two elements here are elements of order 3, and homomorphisms must send elements of order K to elements whose order is a divisor of K, that means I need to send uh, these to order 3 or 1 elements inside Z mod 6, but because it has to be a 1 to 1 homomorphism, we know they've got to be order 3. And so I need to send 1 and 2, respectively, to 2 and 4 in Zmod 6. So in other words, I'm kind of setting ourselves up here to think of this first function as the doubling function, mod 6. So g of x equals 2x mod 6, 0 to 0, 1 to 2, 2 to 4. That's a 1 to 1 homomorphism from Zmod 3 into Zmod 6. Great. So what's next? Next, I want to understand how the cosets of this subgroup inside of Zmod 6 are going to look like Zmod 2. To do that, first we realize that this subgroup, 0, 2, 4, it's the cyclic subgroup in Z mod 6, generated by the number 2, that this is my subgroup that's isomorphic to Z mod 3. And we want this second row here, therefore, to be the non-trivial coset of that subgroup. So what elements do I want there? I just want them to be the elements of H, uh, and then combined with an element that's not in that subgroup. So 1 plus H would be a coset that does the trick. So my elements here are 1, 3, and 5. This now accounts for all the elements in Z mod 6. And then the projection map is just the reduction mod 2. f of x is equal to x mod 2. So all my even numbers in Z mod 6 are getting sent to 0. All my odd numbers in Z mod 6 are getting sent to 1. We can check that this does give me an exact sequence. Z mod 3, 1 to 1 uh, homomorphism into Z mod 6 which then has an onto homomorphism onto Z mod 2. And the image of the first map, so that would be the subgroup 0, 2, 4, is exactly the same set as the kernel of the second map. Everything which is getting sent to the identity, 0, has to have been something that came from this original subgroup, because those are exactly the even residues mod 6. But then you might say, well, this isn't that surprising that Z mod 6 would solve this product problem, because as we've seen pretty recently, Z mod 6 is actually isomorphic to the external direct product of Z3 with Z2. So let me be explicit about how that external direct product shows up in this example. Remember in our last video we said that the external direct product is going to be a solution, and it's going to be the only solution, whenever my inclusion map can be reversed, whenever there is what we would call a, a section, uh, or sometimes a, a pullback or a, a lift. Um, so what that would mean, again, is another homomorphism which sends all the elements from B into A, 
such that the composition of first doing G and then doing H gives me the identity. And one way of defining that pullback in this example is it's just the quotient of any of these residues mod 6 when I divide by 2. So for example, if I divide 5 by 2, the quotient is 2. When I divide 2 by 2, the quotient is 1. So I'm really just pushing all the elements back onto the row. So I'm just sort of projecting this vertically onto this first row. This gives kind of a really friendly picture because now we can kind of see the projection, the f function, which takes me over into this, this green group, my cosets, as just being a horizontal projection. So squishing everything here onto 0 and 1. And we can think of the vertical map as squishing everything from here onto whatever is representing its column. So how is that an external direct product? Well, if we think about what the elements 0 through 5, the residues mod 6, look like, if we think of them in terms of quotients and remainders, it's going to exactly give us the external direct product. For example, 4, when I divide it by 2, has a quotient of 2 and a remainder of 0. 2 has a quotient of 1 and a remainder of 0. 5 has a quotient of 2 and a remainder of 1. So all I'm doing is I'm just relating these elements in Z mod 6 to the quotient as an element of Z mod 3 and the remainder as an element of Z mod 2. And that gives me exactly an isomorphism between Z mod 6 and the external direct product of Z mod 3 with Z mod 2. We're just finding the quotient up here as an element of, uh, of my first group Z mod 3 by following the H function, which remember doesn't always exist, but it does in this case, and then finding the remainder by following the, uh, the remainder function, the, the F function, over here onto the right. So this does look exactly like an external direct product. And to be absolutely certain about why that is, let's think about how the ordered pairs, quotient, comma, remainder, combine together inside of this group. Well, each of those quotient remainder pairs is really just representing 2 times the quotient plus the remainder. That's what it means to be the quotient and remainder when we divide by 2. And when I add those together, the distributive property of multiplication over addition means I can group the quotients together, group the remainders together. 2q1 plus r1 added to 2q2 plus r2 is twice the sum of q1 and q2 plus the sum of r1 and r2. So at the end of the day, the quotients have added, the remainders have added, and they have not interacted with one another. So they're staying on opposite sides of the masking tape line in the I Love Lucy house. This is an external direct product because there's no interaction. So this also gives us a nice explicit isomorphism for why Z6 is actually isomorphic to the external direct product Z3 plus Z2. My promise, though, was that this is not the only way to form a product of Z3 and Z2 or sometimes what algebraists call an extension of Z3 by Z2. It's not the only way to do it. I claimed it was the only way when this inclusion map was reversible by a homomorphism called H. So if we want to build something different, as we want to over here, let's try and find an uh, inclusion homomorphism that's not reversible by a homomorphism. Well, we know that the inclusion from Z3 into S3 has got to be a one-to-one -one homomorphism, so it's got to send the identity of Z3 to the identity of S3, so the trivial permutation. And it needs to send elements of order 3 to elements of order 3, because this needs to be a one-to-one -one homomorphism. Uh, we can't send those to the identity. Therefore, our only options are to send these order 3 elements to the three cycles, 1, 2, 3, and 1, 3, 2. We could do that in either order that we want to. I'm just going to pick to send 1 to 1, 2, 3, and 2 to 1, 3, 2. So I can think of this function as being g of x equals the 3 cycle, 1, 2, 3, raised to the power x. If I raise it to the 0th power, I get the identity. If I raise it to the 1st power, I get itself. I raise it to the 2nd power, you can check, I get 1, 3, 2. After all, that is its inverse. And the 2nd power of any element of order 3 is going to be the same thing as the inverse of that element. So that's my g function. And that's how I'm going to realize z mod 3 as a subgroup in S3. Notice. This is a subgroup isomorphic to Z3. It also happens to be exactly the same as the alternating subgroup inside of S3. It's all the even permutations of three symbols. So where do I get my second row from? Similarly to before, I'm going to want that second row to be a non-trivial coset of H. This time to find that coset, I'm going to take an element which doesn't belong to H, let's say the transposition 1, 2, and I'm just going to multiply on the right all these elements by 1, 2. Since it's its own inverse, it's the same thing as the right action by 1, 2. So that's going to give me 1, 2, 1, 3, and 2, 3 as my non-trivial coset. 
So now how do I define this onto homomorphism from S3 onto C2 that relates exactly these three elements to the number 0 and exactly those three elements to the number 1? Well, we can think of that as being a sine homomorphism. It gives me 0 for all the even permutations. It gives me 1 for all the odd permutations. You can check that that actually satisfies the homomorphism property. After all, when I compose even permutations together, the result is even, and 0 plus 0 is 0. When I compose odd permutations together, the result is even, and 1 plus 1 is equal to 0. And if I compose an even with an odd, the result is odd, because 0 plus 1 is equal to 1. So here is a short exact sequence that gives me S3 in the middle, with Z3 on the left side, Z2 on the right side. So how are we to understand this as being a product? What does this have to do with the product construction that we saw over here? Well, one way to think about it is in the similar fashion to think about how we would express each of these six permutations as a composition of a power of 1, 2, 3 and a power of 1, 2. Each of the elements on this first row contains no powers of 1, 2, but it contains respectively 0, 1, and 2 powers of 1, 2, 3. After all, that's how we defined this inclusion homomorphism in the first place. And on the second row, they all contain a power of 1, 2, 3 composed on the right with a power, namely the first power, of 1, 2. And if I look at these exponents, what's popping out at me is that these exponents are exactly the same as the quotients and remainders that we had over here in our left side example. And so there's a way in which we can think of each of these as being an ordered pair of an element of z3 and an element of z2. 1, 3, 2 can be represented by 2, 0 because it's 2 powers of 1, 2, 3 composed with 0 powers of 1, 2, and so forth. So on its face, it looks like we have another direct product construction. I just relate to the, the ordered pair xy the composition of x powers of 1, 2, 3 with y powers of 1, 2. And indeed, there is a bijection here. But is there also the same relationship between the operations on those elements as we had in the direct product example on the left? To figure that out, let's just try taking two elements, two ordered pairs, if you like, x1, y1, and x2, y2, which again are representing x1 powers of 1, 2, 3, y1 powers of 1, 2, composed with x2 powers of 1, 2, 3, and y2 powers of 1, 2. And let's simplify out that composition and see what ordered pair we actually end up getting at the end of the day. And as you might suspect, the actual sort of sticking point here is that my 1, 2s and my 1, 2, 3s are not next to one another in a way that I can combine their exponents. In order to make that happen, I'm going to need to trade places between this power of the transposition 1, 2 and this power of the 3 cycle 1, 2, 3. Since permutations are not in general commutative, there might be something interesting that happens when I trade those places. And in fact, in the group S3, we can say specifically what that trading places looks like. When I actually have a power of 1, 2 here in the middle, so when y1, my power of 1, 2, is not equal to 0, so when this transposition is actually here, if I leapfrog it past the 3 cycle, I'm going to need to replace the 3 cycle with its own inverse. We can think of this as being the same thing as in the dihedral group, tr being replaced by r inverse t. So when I actually have a non-trivial power of 1, 2 here, when y1 is not equal to 0, then when I trade places, x2 gets replaced by minus x2. On the other hand, if I didn't have a power of 1, 2 here in the middle, if y1 were equal to 0, then I would just get x2 rather than minus x2. So I'd just be adding these exponents instead of subtracting them. So when we finally do all the simplification, the number of powers of 1, 2, 3, the 3 cycle that I have, is x1 added to either x2 or minus x2, depending on whether we had a, uh, one power of the transposition or no powers of the transposition. So I'll get a minus x2 here exactly when y1 is not equal to 0, but I'll get no minus sign when y1 is equal to 0. But meanwhile, my transpositions, my 1, 2s, I just get y1 plus y2 as the exponent. So what the ordered pair arithmetic looks like in the example on the right is that my y1s and y2s have added together. That should be a plus sign. But the x1s and the x2s have not necessarily just added together. And whether or not they just added together or whether they have a minus sign in front of the x2 is determined by the value of y1. So unlike in the I Love Lucy house, we have 
Ricky crossing over onto Lucy's side and doing something, right? interfering with the operation that's happening on the left sides of my ordered pairs, but interfering in a systematic way. In this example, when y1 is not equal to 0, so when the second entry in my ordered pair is a 1, then I get a minus sign in front of this x2. When the second entry in my ordered pair is 0, I don't get a minus sign in front of this x2. And that's the reason that I get a different construction for this product over here on the right, is that these elements y1 are interfering on the left-hand side of my ordered pair operation by determining an automorphism of the group A that then gets applied to x2 before it gets combined with x1. So it's stirring the pot in the first entry of that ordered pair. And that's the reason why S3, the symmetric group on three symbols, is also a solution to this product problem. All the elements can be thought of as ordered pairs again, but now those ordered pairs combine together in a different way than they did when we were just using the direct product. In our next video, I want to put this construction onto a firmer foundation to define this construction as what's called a semi-direct product. Rather than a direct product of Z3 with Z2, it's going to be called a semi-direct product of Z3 with Z2. So in our last video here, we're going to see what semi-direct products are in generality. How are they defined and how do they work?